Welcome to the weekly sermon at Church of the Resurrection. We're glad that you're here. Resurrection is a place where kids, students, and adults find a safe, authentic, and welcoming community where everyone belongs. If you don't have a church family, we'd like to invite you to join us for worship online at core.org slash live or in person at any of our locations in the Kansas City area. You can learn more about us at core.org. We pray that God will use this message to help you grow in your faith journey and inspire you to make a difference in the world around you. My name is Blake Thomas. I'm one of the pastors here at Resurrection. As we continue in worship, I invite you to hear these words of scripture. Our first scripture passage comes from Matthew chapter 22. A legal expert tested him. Teacher, what is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your being, and with all your mind. And from Philippians chapter one, this is my prayer that your love might become even more and more rich with knowledge and all kinds of insight. I pray this so that you will be able to decide what really matters. And so you will be sincere and blameless on the day of Christ. May God add a blessing to the reading, hearing, and understanding of the scripture. Religion has seen a marked decline in recent years. To some, it feels irrelevant or hopelessly outdated and worn out, like an old piece of furniture to be discarded. What if the problem isn't faith, but the way it's been practiced? What if our faith is simply in need of restoration? In the process, we might find a meaningful, authentic, and compelling faith, one that enriches our lives and positively impacts our world. I really appreciate that sermon starter because it captures some really important ideas. The first one is there's a huge number of people who've dropped out of church or other religious communities in the last 25 years, a huge number. Uh, The second thing it captures is that for many of those people who've dropped out, the feeling is that religion is passe. It's, it's worn out. It's, it's, uh, you know, could easily be, be discarded like that piece of furniture on the street. But I love the last line in that, which talks about the fact that maybe the problem isn't with religion or isn't with faith or isn't with Jesus. If you're a Christian, maybe the problem is with how we've practiced our faith. Maybe that's what's been found to be wanting. And so in this sermon series, we kick off today, we're going to spend the next three weeks talking about what might a compelling, authentic faith look like? The kind of faith that would draw people who've dropped out of church back to church or back to faith. What would it look like in our lives if we were living such a compelling, authentic faith that people would be drawn to want to know more about about our faith and, and where we would be easily able to live it and share it in the world? We're going to be pursuing an understanding of three big ideas that are important to a compelling, authentic faith. That's where we're heading over the next few weeks. But I wanna begin just with this understanding of what's happening in the church world. And we've talked about this here at Resurrection last fall, but I wanna just briefly summarize some things that we have, uh, some additional data I'd say, that's come out in the last month. And so the first is, this is a a chart that I shared with you from the Gallup poll uh, last fall, although it's been updated to include 2023. So as late as the year 2000, 70% of Americans were members of a church, a synagogue, a mosque, or a temple. Today, that number is 45%. 45, so from 70% to 45% in just a 24 year period of time, that's astounding. That's 40 million people who used to belong to a church, a synagogue, a faith community, who no longer attend, who no longer are participating. Across the country, 49% of people say they rarely or never attend religious services. And so there's a huge decline in the number of people actively participating in a faith community. Why is that? And that's what PRRI wanted to find out. So last year, the public uh, religion uh, Research Institute surveyed 5,600 and I don't know, 70 people across America who are no longer participating in their faith communities and wanted to know why. And I just want to share with you their top responses. This uh, report was just issued last month. So uh, 67% stopped believing what their religion taught. So they, had, they were wrestling with doubt. They were struggling with questions about, the, about what their faith had taught them. 47% cited the church's negative teaching about LGD, LGBTQ persons. 32% said church was bad for their mental health. Can you imagine? 31% said sexual abuse scandals among clergy. A large number of Catholics pointed to that, but so did Protestants. 30% noted the church's polarizing politics. Now, this has become so prevalent that there's actually a name been given, especially to that 67%, well, really, probably a lot more than that, to the people who have looked at their faith and walked away. uh, The name that's been given is deconstruction. 
So deconstruction, and this is particularly used among fundamentalist and conservative evangelicals who left their faith. They began to examine their faith. They took it apart piece by piece and they left it behind. Some of them got re-engaged in other faith communities. Some of them left faith altogether. And so another term I want you to know, it's, you'll, sh- you'll see it in the news, uh, not just deconstruction, but people who were evangelicals or conservative and maybe fundamentalist Christians who left that, they're often called ex-evangelicals. They were evangelicals who were ex-evangelicals. They're ex evangelicals, people who have left the faith altogether. So as we think about that group of folks, the 40 million, the question again that I want to ask is, what would a church, what would a faith community look like that that 40 million, at least some of that 40 million would look at and go, oh, well, that's the kind of church I might be a part of. Or, Or they would meet a Christian like you perhaps, and they would say, oh, you're not like the other Christians that I've known. Or I'm, I'm interested in a faith that looks like your kind of faith. It's not the kind of faith I was raised with or the kind of faith I experienced or I was living when I was younger, but I'm interested in the kind of faith that you're expressing. What would that kind of church, what would that kind of faith look like? And I'm gonna propose three big ideas over the next three weeks. And again, this is not just about churches, but it's also about us as individual Christians and how we live and pursue the Christian life. So the first big idea that we're gonna pursue this week is, uh, is and I'll draw upon the Latin, eruditio et uh, religio, eruditio et religio. Uh, Latin, it, it is uh, knowledge or the intellect uh, and religion. And when it comes to religion, it's really a vital faith. What Charles Wesley described and John Wesley described the founders of Methodism as vital piety. And so this idea of bringing these two things together is really important. When we think about people, that 67% who said, what I learned when I was growing up doesn't make sense to me anymore. I can't bend my brain into a pretzel and make myself believe that anymore. I'm really struggling. And because I no longer believe that, I'm not really sure if I can believe anything anymore. And part of the challenge is that there are many churches where doubt is considered uh, forbidden. You are not to express doubt. You know, if you really have faith, you're not gonna have doubt. And somehow doubt is the enemy of faith, but doubt is not the enemy of faith. Doubt is a pathway, as we've talked about before, to a deeper faith. If we doubt something, and then we take the time to really research and study and understand, and we've earnestly done that, and we find that that really that doubt was well-placed, then good, we've learned that this is something we shouldn't have put our faith in to begin with. But if we study and, and understand you know, deeply, we might just come to a place where we maybe have a different understanding or we have a deeper understanding and it leads to a deeper faith. Knowledge and education and the intellect is not the enemy of faith. All right, so when we think about that, I think about what Jesus says. Jesus says this, he says, you know this, this is the great commandment. Quoting Moses, he says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your being, and with all your mind, mind. So the Greek word is dianoia, dianoia. I want you to, if you can, maybe even write that down, dianoia. And as you think about the word dianoia, what it meant, so noia comes from uh, from the word that signifies the brain or the intellect, the mind. So dianoia, d is through. And so the idea is wrestling, you know, is thinking something through. It's not just the mind, it's using the mind to think things through. It is sometimes translated in some of the Greek dictionaries, critical thinking. So dianoia is critical thinking. You're to love God with your critical thinking. You are to engage your brain in the act of pursuing your faith when it comes to theology, when it comes to understanding the Bible, when it comes to understanding spirituality, when it comes to understanding life, you love God with your mind, use your brain. I remember that old public service announcement ages ago, you know, when I was growing up, the mind is a terrible thing to waste. Well, that's true. And God gave you a brain. It's one of the greatest gifts God could give you and he intends for you to use it. And so faith is meant to be pursued alongside critical thinking, knowledge, education, books, libraries. They are not the enemy to faith, science, <clears throat> psychology, the, the deeper studies, you know, the, the intellectual studies. These are not enemies to faith. They are tools that can lead to a greater faith. They're meant to be combined together. Faith, vital piety is about our meaning in life. And is there a higher purpose? And is there, is there a God? Is there something greater than we are? You know, that, that, that beckons us, that created us, that has a purpose and meaning for our lives, <clears throat> religion, and ties into morality and, and, and a whole host of other, other things, the values that we have, that and intellect are meant to go hand in hand. If you have the intellect without, without morality, without uh, theology, without, without a, a, a sense of values and purpose, and I would say without an understanding that there's a reason for our existence, you don't have a whole picture of what we were made for. All right, so Jesus says that we are to love God with our mind, with our intellect. We are to study, to ask questions. And it's okay 
when we wrestle with doubt. God is never offended by our doubts. God is not, God understands that, you know, it's hard for us to grasp things. You know, our brain is three pounds of gray matter, hardly adequate to comprehend the God of the universe. And if you feel like you've got God all figured out, then your God is way, way too small. So God understands our wrestling with doubt. And if you read through the Bible, you find that great people of faith often had doubts. They wrestled with doubt. Even Jesus at one moment, when he's, uh, when he's praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, when he's hanging on the cross, he's asking questions. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Doubt comes even to Jesus at one moment in his life. All right, so I wanna say this and I wanna make this as clear as I can. God is not glorified by ignorance, <clears throat> bad or superficial theology, by nonsensical ideas or by gullible followers. That does not glorify God, right? And so, so we are meant to engage the intellect when it comes to our faith. I was watching a sermon this last week. Uh, there was a link on my Facebook page and, uh, or tw- I'm sorry, Twitter. And I thought that sounds kind of strange. And I clicked on the link and I watched this sermon and uh, it was on the West Coast. It was a, uh, I, I'm not gonna say any names or anything else. I'll simply say that as I watched the sermon, I thought this is unsettling to me. Uh, and, and you had t- 2,000 people in a room, it looked like, and they were cheering on and they were getting riled up. And this, and this pastor was riling people up and he was, he was using words that were inflammatory and he was, he was talking about the enemy. And, and, you know, the enemy that he was talking about weren't, you know, it wasn't Satanism or something. The enemy he was talking about was the other political party, right? And, and, uh, and as he's describing this, he puts a picture up of his favorite presidential candidate. And then, and then as he continues in this process, you know, these people are so stirred up and riled up. And, and when he got to the end, I thought, this is scary because this person has taken religion and, and mixed in policy. Actually, it, it wasn't even about religion. It was using religion in order to make a political point. And in the process of doing that, riling people up and stirring up not love, but hatred in them or, or anger or, or, or willingness to go to war against other people. It just, when I watched it, I thought this doesn't sound at all like Jesus or the kingdom that he was preaching or the apostle Paul or the prophets. And my hope is if you hear sermons like that, if you are paying attention to things that are messages that are coming online, that you're gonna have a chance to evaluate those and measure those in the light of Jesus. Does it sound like Jesus? Does it sound like the kingdom that he preached about? Does it sound like the apostle Paul? Does it sound like the prophets in the Hebrew Bible? Does it sound like the God whose nature is love? But you see, you have to use discernment in that. You have to engage your intellect and and, and this this idea of of dianoia, which is uh, not just, using your brain, but it's, it's critically thinking, right? You love God with your mind by asking questions. I want to remind you that, uh, that the apostle Paul, not the apostle Paul, Jesus said uh, to, uh, at one point in one audience, he says, uh, the day is going to come where, and he's talking about the day of judgment, where you're going to cry out, Lord, Lord. And I'm going to say to you, I never knew you. I have no idea who you are because you weren't really p- pursuing me or following me. And here's the thing. When you mix religion and politics in this way, religion always loses it always loses. It always becomes used for some political purpose. And so that's whether you're on the left or the right, you have to be careful about that, right? We have to be discerning because we are, if you are a Christian, you are a follower of Jesus, who is the King who came to proclaim a different kind of kingdom, a kingdom not of this world, but one which we pray will become like this world or the world will become like it, the kingdom of God. And so when Christianity gets coupled with either right-wing or left-wing politics or politics, I'd say, as a whole. When our politics are not being shaped by our religion, but our religion is being used to accomplish political purposes, our religion loses. It's no longer Christianity. All right, so I want to mention one other area where we have to think critically. There's a whole lot of them I'd love to pursue, you know, love to mention, but today I just want to mention one more. And we'll talk more about politics when we talk about radically loving next week. But when I think about, uh, when I think about this idea of uh, using and engaging the intellect and critically thinking, I think about the uh, conspiracy theories that are out there today and the false information that shows up on my Twitter feed. This happens every single day when I look at Twitter, <clears throat> when I look at social media, there are things out there and I think that cannot be true. Come on, is that really true? And then, you know, it looks so real and there's, there's plenty of people who comment on it like, well, yeah, see, that's what I always knew. I knew it was like that. And then you go in and you do a little research and you find out, oh, maybe it's not quite what that little tweet said, right? Maybe the truth is different. And if something seems like absurd, it probably is. 
Not always, but most of the time, it's probably absurd. So take the time to research and study. I did that this week with something, a claim that was made. I thought, wow, how did I never hear about that? I can't believe that's right. And so I went online to look to see some of those sources that you know study these things to see, is it really true? <clears throat> and there was no evidence for this, but certainly on Twitter, it sounded like it was true. But anyway, I want you to think about this because according to PRRI, the Public Religion Research Institute, <clears throat> Christians were, t- listen to this, Christians were twice as likely to believe conspiracy theories spread on social media than religiously unaffiliated people. Let me take a drink here. <clears throat> Let me read that one more time. <clears throat> Christians were twice as likely to believe conspiracy theories spread on social media than religiously unaffiliated people. How sad is that? Right? You see, when we disconnect or disjoin religion and piety, religion, excuse me, religion and knowledge, we find ourselves with a a faith that will believe almost anything. So I I find it disturbing that atheists and agnostics are more willing to ask questions of things that they see than Christians who will simply accept them because they go along with their biases. We have got to be different. We have to be better than that. And again, dianoia, using the critical thinking skills that God has given you. Love God with your mind. We're not meant to accept everything that we see or read on social media or in the news or anywhere else. So when we embrace falsehoods, we pass them on as though they're true and we repost them on social media, we violate the ninth commandment. And the ninth commandment is thou shall not bear false witness. You shall not say things and witness against somebody, things that you don't know are true. And so we've got to be better than that. And this is true with most of the conspiracy theories. Right? And occasionally there's left-wing conspiracy theories. More often I see right-wing conspiracy theories. I don't care where it comes from. We've got to engage our intellect in asking questions. And here's part of the dilemma is in our brains, we have an amygdala. It's it's a little part of our brain, very, you know, at the deep heart of our brain, and it's designed to protect us. It's designed to notice potential threats and to lead our body to flee or fight, right? So the fight or flight mechanism. And uh, and so the amygdala detects a potential fear. And then it's, what's supposed to happen is our higher intellectual abilities are meant to then ask, is this really a threat or not? We're meant to analyze. We're meant to use that kind of critical thinking. But if we don't do that, then what we find ourselves doing is being afraid all the time. And you see politicians are masters at using fear, but so are preachers, so are a whole lot of other people, masters at using fear to lead us to act. And we're not meant to be controlled by fear. The scripture tells us that perfect love casts out fear. A hundred and some times, 135 times the Bible, we're told, don't be afraid. All right. So I found when I was thinking about this way that people don't engage their intellect when it comes to their faith, I was thinking about uh, a report that came out in in 2021 from MIT's Technology Review. They found in in 2019, uh, during the election season, 19 of the top 20 Christian Facebook pages were run by Eastern European troll farms. Right. So these troll farms in Eastern Europe are posting things on Facebook, and 19 of the 20 you know most visited sites on Facebook were all fake. And they were, they were, again, trying to mislead Christians. You see the Eastern Europeans, some of whom have no faith in God whatsoever, had no problem with trying to appeal to people's faith, people who don't engage their critical thinking skills. It, Christianity Today reported in 2017, so this goes back to the previous election, the 2016 election, in 2017 that Russian operatives created a popular Facebook page to target conservative Christians with popular face, excuse me, with Jesus-filled memes as a part of a broad social media campaign to stir dissension among Americans during the 2016 election. I mean, how sad is that, that the Russians knew to target Christians and to put together memes that featured the face of Jesus and things that were not true in order to stir people up and to lead them to divide from one another. I mean, we've got to engage our intellect. And you can imagine that there are many people out there who are a part of faith communities who don't agree with the theology or the, or the politics of their particular church. And they see these things happening and they say, if that's what it means to be a Christian, I don't want any part of that. Those are the ex-evangelicals. This is part of the 40 million who've dropped out of church. So I want you to listen once more to the words of the apostle Paul. This is really great advice Paul's giving to the church at Philippi. And he says this, this is my prayer that your love might become even more and more rich with knowledge and all kinds of insight I pray this so that you will be able to decide what really matters. And so you will be sincere and blameless on the day of Christ. All right. In the fall of 1982, I was in college and I was at a charismatic university, Oral Roberts University. I was studying to be a Pentecostal or charismatic pastor, but I had lots of questions. 
And I remember my pastor there telling me, you know, don't ask so many questions, just accept it by faith. And it's like, I can't, you know, these are serious questions. And I think there should be some answers to these questions. And, uh, and then two of my best friends were killed in an accident. I've shared the story many times. And that brought all of those questions to a head. And I nearly lost my faith at that point. And I thought, I'm gonna, I'm gonna study and I'm gonna try to see, are there answers to these questions? And in the end, the answers that I found to those questions were found among, among theologians who were Methodists. And it got me thinking, well, I wonder what the United Methodist Church believes. And, and it led me to search and try to understand the history of the Methodist revival in the 18th century, the 1700s, led by John Wesley and his little brother, Charles. And, and as I was studying and reading and trying to understand what I found was a church that valued the intellect, where, where Methodists believe that you should have both an, a strong emphasis on the intellect and a strong emphasis on vital piety, a vital religion. These two things are meant to go hand in in hand. John Wesley was the founder of the Methodist movement. And you'll see him in this image from our resurrection stained glass window here at the Leewood location. He traveled a half a million miles on horseback across the British Isles and in Ireland and Scotland, uh, aiming, well, you know, all of the British Isles, aiming to help people know Christ. And he was a scholar. He wasn't just a preacher. He was a scholar preacher. He was a, he was a teacher, an instructor, a fellow at Oxford University. And so he understood the power and the importance of the intellect. There was a small group of college students there uh, led by his brother. His brother was one of them, uh, Charles Wesley. And they were meeting together and they were wanting to find a deep, passionate faith and at the same time to pursue the intellect. And they came together to study and they asked their, you know, Charles's older brother, John, would you please mentor us? And so he begins to mentor them. And this is the first rise of Methodism. People called them Methodists. They were so methodical in their faith. And the thing was, they didn't just pursue singing and worship and the sacraments. They also pursued education. They studied every day they got together. They studied the Bible and the original languages. They studied philosophy, history, you know, geography, science, all of these things. They believe that you should, that a person of faith should also be studying and using their intellect to, to understand the world around them. And that, that would better help us be, you know, more faithful followers of Christ. I mean, bringing these two things together was really important. Uh, Wesley described himself in a, using a Latin phrase, homo unius libri, a man of one book, meaning the Bible. So he loved the Bible and it was the book that defined his life. But you know, Wesley also had a thousand other books in his library. So there was one book that was most important, but there were a thousand other books in his library. He was very well read, wrote a lot of books. And, and he believed again in the union of the intellect and the heart. So Methodism from its inception thought this. It started on the campus of Oxford University, the leading university in the world, and the movement started there. And so again, this union of faith and intellect. And when those early Methodists began to live out their faith, one of the things they said is education really matters. So they began working to educate coal miners children. These are kids, their parents couldn't afford to send them to school. And so they began tutoring children. Why? Because they believed that every child needed to have access to an education. In 1748, they started, the Methodists started the first school that they would start. Later, they would, they would start over a thousand other schools around the world. The first one was called the Kingswood School. This was for coal miners' children, as well as for preachers' children, so they could go and they could study. And, and when Methodism came to America, again, this strong emphasis on the intellect and the pursuit of the intellect and the heart of faith that was not just a heart knowledge, had not just a heart knowledge, but also and intellectual knowledge. So they started colleges and universities across America. The first four-year college started in Kansas, Baker University, named after Bishop Baker. It wasn't K-State or KU, it was, it was Baker University. And then there were others that were started in Kansas, Kansas Wesley and Southwestern University in Missouri, there was Central Methodist College. And then beyond that, across the country, they were starting other schools. Eventually, well, today there's 113 colleges and universities related to the United Methodist Church across the United States. And among those, there are 11 historically black colleges. That was important in Methodist Methodism, but there was also schools like maybe these names you'd be familiar with, Southern Methodist University, Vanderbilt University, University of Southern California, USC, Duke University, Northwestern University, uh, Emory University, all of these, some of them, the leading schools in America started by United Methodists. And here in Kansas City, the very first public school open to anybody was started in the basement of the Westport Methodist Church. This was an emphasis we had then, we still have today, which is why at Resurrection, we have uh, partner schools, 36 partner schools in the United States and across the country. 13 of them are 14 here in Kansas City, I believe. And then the rest in different parts of the world, because we believe education matters, preschools, elementary schools, and, and on from there. That's an important part of who we are. So Charles Wesley wrote a hymn. It was really a prayer to begin with, set in verse, and eventually set to music. And it was a hymn, it was a prayer for children. And you get to the fifth stanza and he wrote, uh, unite the pair so long disjoined, knowledge and vital piety, learning and holiness, truth and love. Like he recognized that often among Christians, they divided those two. And so knowledge and truth and, and, and the intellect was placed over here. But this is what we really focus on is our faith. And he said, those two have to be held together. 
which is where this phrase comes from, eruditio et religio. Now, my Latin's rough, so that may not be pronounced properly, but uh, uh, eruditio is intellect, knowledge, uh, et and religio, and religion, and particularly this idea of vital piety. It's inspired by this particular uh, hymn of Charles Wesley's. And if you go to Duke University, the, the seal of the university and its motto, you'll see it there at the bottom, eruditio et religio that this is knowledge and vital piety, knowledge and faith. These two things are meant to go hand in hand. In a world where 67% of the 40 million people who have left their faith have said it's because they had questions that went unanswered. It was because they had doubts and maybe they were made to feel bad about their doubts. It was because they had a faith that didn't make any sense. I think churches that bring together knowledge and vital piety, eruditio et religio, are churches that have a chance of connecting with those folks and helping them find faith once more, a faith that makes sense to the intellect and to the heart, a faith that's intellectually satisfying and, and allows them room for curiosity and asking questions and a faith that, that transforms their hearts and their lives. This, I think, is the kind of church and the kind of faith that is compelling in this new world that we live in today. All right, I wanna share one last thing with you before we wrap this up. And that is the, uh, an idea that describes how John Wesley and the early Methodists practiced their faith, how they did theology, their theological method. And uh, Albert Outler, one of the great Methodist theologians, he was at SMU, he was at Yale, and then at SMU in the 20th century, he coined the phrase, he called it the Wesleyan quadrilateral. I'd love for you to write that down, the Wesleyan quadrilateral. Now, when he coined this phrase, he later recognized quadrilateral probably wasn't the right metaphor. That signifies a four-sided object, and that doesn't necessarily work perfectly with this idea. But what he was trying to summarize was in all of his research and study of, of John Wesley and his theology, his theological method, he found that there were four things that he used to discern what he believed and why he believed it and how he would practice his faith. And these are really important. The Anglican church of his day, he was an Anglican priest. They practiced three of them. He added a fourth one. So the first one was scripture. Scripture is the foundation for everything else that we believe. It is a compilation, a library, a collection of documents that were written uh, over a period of about 1500 years. And they described the faith of God's people over a long period of time uh, before, you know, during the time of Moses, during the time of the exile later on in the New Testament period, the early church, what Jesus said and did, what Paul said about that and what the early apostles said about, about what Jesus did and what the church looked like and how they practiced their faith. All of this, uh, Christians believe God was at work in and through the biblical authors. And so we have this body of information, you know, that, that in some sense is like the U.S. Constitution for how we run our country. It is how we live our faith and it is the basis for how we know what we know about our faith. But Wesley said, it's not enough just to have the scriptures. He understood that you could argue almost anything from scripture. You could pull a scripture here, a scripture there. It wasn't enough to say, God said it. I believe it, that settles it. We have to engage our, dia, uh, our, uh, our dianoia. We have, to, we have to engage our faith, our intellect with our faith. And so he said, and early Anglicans, they said the same thing. They said, okay, in addition to that, we look to see what is the church taught through the ages? across the last 2000 years, what did the council say? What did the fathers of the church say? What did people in the East and the Western part of the church say? What did great theologians and, and biblical scholars and saints, what did they say? And what are they still saying to this day? And that's, that's called tradition. That's what the church has said across a long period of time and how the Holy Spirit has worked through the broader church. And, and then he said, we also bring to bear reason, intellect, uh, dianoia, dianoia. We bring that together, our critical thinking skills. And then finally, Wesley added a fourth to what the Anglicans held on to in the 18th century. He added experience. This is the experience of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer that God, God works in our hearts and lives. We have experiences of God, experiences of, of people. And, and through all of those experiences, the Spirit is at work also helping us to discern what's right and wrong. And so when we come to, to critical issues, when we come to theological issues, when we come to studying the Bible, we don't just simply look to see if we can find a scripture that we can quote and call it good. We bring to bear on that. What has the church said over the ages? What's it saying today? You know, what is our intellect? How does the intellect, how does our, our critical thinking skills, how do we bring that to bear? And then what is the witness of the Holy Spirit in our lives? All of that together helps us to do theology. It helps us to understand God and understand how we live our faith and understand the scriptures. So I want you to say these four with me, if you would, because I'd really love for you to remember this. These are the four parts of the Wesleyan quadrilateral. Scripture, tradition, reason, experience. The most important is scripture. It is foundational. And everything else is how we try to read that. This week, I was reading an article on the Wesleyan Quadrilateral, <clears throat> and it was published in the 132-year-old National Publication of the Methodist Church of Singapore. And I, I really appreciated the graphic that they had to illustrate 
what the Wesleyan quadrilateral looks like. Take a look at this. And, and this is uh, used with permission from Yen Tun Ai, who was, the, who was the creator of this graphic and from the Methodist message. And congratulations to any of them who are watching this because 132 years is amazing that you've been publishing. But I want you to see this. So we see the scriptures laid out before, and then we see the lamps that help illuminate and help us make sense of. And the first one is tradition. And then we find reason and then we find experience. And so we read scripture, we do theology, we pursue the Christian life, we pursue our knowledge of God, starting with scripture and these others illuminate. They help us understand and make sense of our faith. So here's my hope. I hope that at least at Church of the Resurrection and that in your life, wherever you may be, I hope that we are uniting together the two so long disjoined that is knowledge and vital piety that we're a church that doesn't ask people to check their brains at the door when they walk in, but instead is a place where you're welcome to come with your questions, with your doubts. Are you an atheist or agnostic? Thanks for coming to church. We're really glad that you're here. We want you to be here. This is a great place for you to come. And we're not gonna cram something down your throat. We're gonna try to share as best as we understand the truth. And we're gonna invite you to study and chew on this and think about it together too. We're gonna ask all of us as Christians, <clears throat> new Christians, baby Christians, and people who've been Christians for a long time to continue to grow in our faith. We're gonna ask you to read the Bible. We're gonna ask you to do beyond that. We're gonna ask you to study together. We have here Bible studies, Sunday school classes, small groups, all kinds of opportunities at all six of our locations in Kansas City and online for those of you joining us on TV or online. Opportunities for you to be a part of classes with other Christians and people who are not yet Christians but are wrestling with their faith to study, to try to understand. I kind of look at at all that we're offering at all of our locations as sort of a lay seminary. And right now you can find out more about those classes. You can plug in, you can get involved. If you go to cor.org slash next, you're going to find a place where you can get more information about those classes. We're starting new things all the time. We're starting a college-age Bible study this week, actually, that's, that's for students at all, college students at all of our locations that's wrestling with the three of the hardest questions or a number of the hardest questions of the Christian faith. These are opportunities. You get free pizza, opportunities for you to grow deeper in your faith, to make friends with other people, to, to connect together the two so long disjoined knowledge and vital piety. All right. <clears throat> we all, by the way, I'll also mention this. We're the only United Methodist Church in the United States. There's 20,000 plus United Methodist churches in the U.S. We're the only one with an accredited seminary, a graduate school on our campus, St. Paul School of Theology, where you can actually, you can uh, audit classes, you can take classes uh, from, from fantastic professors. You can do them online or in person. I mean, all of this is aimed at saying, we're aiming to be a church for critical thinkers for people who are willing to engage their intellect and in trying to understand the faith and then to live it. All right, let me just remind you of who we are as a congregation. Our purpose, and it's been our purpose since we started this congregation 34 years ago, where there was just four of us and a dream, was to build a Christian community. Why don't you say this together with me? Our purpose at Resurrection is to build a Christian community where non-religious and nominally religious people are becoming deeply committed Christians. There are 40 million non-religious and nominally religious people out there today. And they've been turned off by churches where they didn't feel like they could ask questions or the faith didn't make any sense. And, and I think many of them have the same yearnings and needs that we all have. A need to be loved, a need for community, a need for meaning, a need to, or, you know, a desire to know, is there anything more than what we can see and feel and touch in this world? And my hope and prayer is that churches like ours will be refuges and safe havens and places where those folks can come and where they can rediscover a faith that unites together the intellect and the heart. Eruditio et religio. So I want to remind you of these words as we close from the Apostle Paul. His prayer was that love might become even more and more rich, that your love might become even more and more rich with knowledge and all kinds of insight. And he prays this so that you will be able to discern or to decide what really matters. And so you'll be sincere and blameless on the day of Christ. Let's be a church. Let's be Christians who combined, who combine eruditio and religio. Let's pray. Oh God, help us individually, each of us, to have a desire to go deeper in our faith, to understand more clearly truth wherever it's found, to not be threatened by knowledge, questions, skepticism, to not be threatened by books and learning and science and psychology and, and higher education, but instead help us to see all of these as tools to better understand and know the truth. Help us to be discerning. Help us not to be people who are gullible, who easily believe just whatever we see on social media, or who, who allow our political biases or our sociological biases 
to use our faith, but instead to allow our faith to shape our biases and our understandings of politics and the world around us. God, help us be a place that loves and welcomes the non-religious and nominally religious that, that here in this place and in our lives, wherever we might live across the country, or around the world, that in our churches, if we're not a part of resurrection in our churches, people might see an authentic Christianity that unites the intellect and the heart, eruditio et religio. May that be true in our lives, we pray, and in our churches, in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for watching this week's sermon. We'd love for you to join us again in worship online or in person. To learn more about Church of the Resurrection, you can visit core.org. Have a great week, and we hope to see you next time.